This is Chapter 11, where we'll focus on the design of steel beams using U.S. customary units. Then we'll briefly look at SI units and timber beam design. This slideshow is a companion to the textbook, not a replacement for it. Please read the book for a more complete discussion of SI beams and timber beams. The book contains three fully worked out example problems of steel beam design in U.S. units, one example in SI units, and two examples of timber beam design. The textbook explains how to design beams following six easy steps. What we're doing is starting with a particular loading case, then figuring out the lightest steel beam that will support the load without exceeding the bending strength or shear strength of the steel. We're assuming that the lightest beam is also the cheapest, so this process is about optimizing a design to produce the strongest structure for the lowest cost. In some problems, we have an additional constraint. The beam cannot deflect more than a certain amount, so we're designing for stiffness as well as strength. Once we've picked a beam, we have to add in the weight of the beam, which acts as a uniform distributed load on the beam. Then we have to recheck it to make sure the beam is still good. If it's not still good, we have to pick a bigger beam. Let's work out some example problems. The first example problem is a simply supported beam with a uniform distributed load. We'll use a wide flange steel beam made of A992 steel. Step one is to identify all the loads and design constraints. Step two is to draw the load diagram and calculate the reactions. We can solve for the reactions by drawing an equivalent load diagram and working out the sum of the moments and sum of the forces, but it's much easier in this case to go to Appendix F and use the formula method. The reaction forces at points A and B are both 30 kips. Step three is to draw shear and moment diagrams for this beam. It's a uniform distributed load, so the shear diagram is a pair of triangles, and the moment diagram is a parabola, with a maximum value at the midspan of the beam. We can figure out the maximum value in one of two ways. We can either calculate the area of the left-hand triangle in the shear diagram, or we can use the formula method from Appendix F. Either method will give us a maximum value of 150 kip feet. Step four is to pick a beam. In order to do that, we need to work out the plastic section modulus that is required. Back in chapter nine, we learned that the maximum moment that a steel beam will support is equal to a safety factor times the yield strength of the steel and the plastic section modulus Z. We can rewrite the formula to find out how much Z is needed to support the bending stresses in the beam. It's customary to put the constant in the numerator, so Z required is 1.67 times the maximum moment divided by the yield strength. Running the calculation, this beam needs a Z of at least 60.1 inches to the third power. We look in Appendix D to find a beam with a Z value at least this big, but how do we know which one is the lightest? In the United States, wide flange steel beams are sold by weight per unit length. W beams are des designated with two numbers. The first number is the nominal depth, top to bottom, which is not always the actual depth. A W44 by 290 beam has a nominal depth of 44 inches and an actual depth of 43.6 inches. The second number is the weight per unit length. 
This beam weighs 290 pounds per lineal foot. So a 10 foot long section would weigh 2,900 pounds. Look in Appendix D for a W beam that has a ZX value of at least 60.1 inches cubed. Two beams on this slide meet the criterion, and it would be tempting to pick the first one because it has the lower value of Z. That's not what we're trying to optimize. The second choice is 3 pounds per foot lighter. Do the math. 3 pounds per foot divided by 38 pounds per foot is 0 0.08 or 8%. AW 18 by 35 beam contains 8% less steel. Although the processing costs may be about the same, the material costs are lower, so the overall price should also be lower. This beam weighs 35 pounds per foot, which is the same as 0 0.035 kips per foot. Now we will add in the weight of the beam and recheck the strength. Since the original loading is a uniform distributed load, we can solve it again by adding the applied load to the beam weight per unit length. 3 kips per foot plus 0 0.035 kips per foot gives us 3.035 kips per foot. Using the same equations as before, but with slightly different numbers, we get a maximum shear, maximum moment, and required Z that are all a little bit bigger. We have a beam with a Z value of 66.5 inches cubed. We only need 60.8 inches cubed to support the applied load and the weight of the beam. We have more than we need, therefore the beam is safe in bending. The last step is to check the beam for shear failure. This is actually a pretty rare failure mode in structural beams, but it can happen, so we want to check for it. Remember the average web shear approach from Chapter 9? We can rewrite this equation so that the beam is safe as long as the maximum applied shear load is less than 0.4 times the yield strength times the depth of the beam times the thickness of the web. You can find these values in Appendix D. Plug them into the equation, and we find that the beam can support a shear load of 106 kips. We have a shear load capacity of 106 kips, but we are only applying 30.35 kips. We have more than we need, therefore the beam is safe in shear. Let's modify the previous beam by adding another constraint. In many designs, we want to limit how much deflection occurs in a beam. A rope bridge may be strong enough for foot traffic, but it's not stiff enough to make people feel safe and comfortable. The deflection constraint is added to the list in step one. Step two is exactly the same as before. Step 3 is also the same as before. The maximum moment is 150 kip feet. Step 4 is not the same as before. We still calculate the required z as 60.1 inches to the third power, but we also have to think about deflection. Appendix F tells that the tells us that the maximum deflection of a simply supported beam with a uniform distributed load is five times the weight per length times the length of to the fourth power, all divided by 384 times Young's modulus and the moment of inertia of the beam. The unknown in this problem is the moment of inertia because we haven't picked the beam yet. We need a beam with an I value of at least 600 inches to the fourth power. Looking at the beams in Appendix D, 
we see that the W18 by 35 beam that we used before is no good. Its moment of inertia is less than what we need. Scanning other beams in the table, we find that the lightest beam that meets both the Z and I constraints is a W21 by 50 beam. It weighs 50 pounds per foot. Now we add in the weight of the beam and recalculate the reaction forces and the maximum moment. They're a little higher than in example one because we're using a heavier beam. The new value of Z is 61.1 inches cubed. We have 110 inches cubed. We only need 61.1 inches cubed. We have more than we need, therefore the beam is safe in bending. The next thing to check is the stiffness of the beam. We'll add the moment of inertia needed to support the applied load to the moment of inertia needed to support the beam weight. The total is 610 inches to the fourth power. We have 984 inches to the fourth power in our beam. We only need 610 inches to the fourth power to support the loading. We have more than we need, so the beam is stiff enough to meet the deflection constraint. The last thing we do is check shear. The beam is strong enough to support 158 kips of shear load, but it only has to support 30.5 kips. We have more shear strength than we need, so the beam is safe in shear. The third example is a little different. We have an applied point load and no deflection constraint. Using Appendix F, we can calculate the reaction forces at points A and B. Now we draw shear and moment diagrams and calculate the maximum moment at 16 kip feet. Next, we calculate the required Z and pick the lightest beam. This beam weighs 10 pounds per foot or 0 0.010 kips per foot. We add in the weight of the beam and recalculate the reaction forces. Using the principle of superposition, we can add the reaction forces due to the applied load to the reaction forces due to the beam weight and obtain the total reaction forces. The shear diagram has trapezoids and the moment diagram has parabolas. The maximum shear load is 4.06 kips, the maximum moment is 16.16 kip feet. Now we can recalculate Z and we find that we need 6.48 inches cubed. Again, we have more Z than we need and the beam is safe in bending. Finally, we check shear and again we have more than we need and the beam is safe in shear. Steel W beams in the US are sold by weight per unit length. In most of the rest of the world they're sold by mass per unit length, which means we have to add another step before we can solve these problems. Newton's first law says that force equals mass times acceleration. In our case the force is weight and the acceleration is gravity. When people talk about the force of gravity, they're really talking about weight. We'll need an SI unit definition before proceeding. The unit of weight in SI units is the Newton, which is defined as a kilogram meter per second squared. Let's look at a typical SI W beam. A W250 by 89 
beam has a nominal depth of 250 millimeters. Appendix D lists its actual depth as 259 millimeters, which is about 10 inches. This beam has a mass per unit length of 89 kilograms per meter. Multiply it by the acceleration of gravity, then insert the definition of the Newton, convert Newtons to kilonewtons, and we have 1.13 kilonewtons per meter. The rest of the beam design procedure is exactly the same as for U.S. customary steel W-beams. The last topic in the chapter is timber beams. The procedure is almost the same as for steel W-beams, with a couple of exceptions. First, we don't use plastic section modulus. Instead, we use S, the section modulus of the timber. It's actually simpler because there's no safety factor constant in the equation. Instead, the safety factor is built into the value of allowable bending stress. You can find values for section modulus for timber beams in Appendix E. Second, in Step 6, we can solve the general shear equation for rectangular cross-sections. Shear stress equals 3 times the maximum shear load divided by two times the cross-sectional area of the timber. We can rewrite the formula to give us an equation for the shear load. As long as the actual shear load is less than 2A allowable shear divided by 3, then the timber is safe. There are two fully worked out examples of timber beam design in the textbook, one in U.S. units and the other in SI units.